Okay. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. We're so excited to start this series and I'm really glad that Mike Blanche is on because he was a big part of the inspiration for putting this together. Um, if this is your first time to be a part of the conversation, welcome. Um, my name is Kim Porter. I'm the executive director. Um, well, I'll introduce some other folks in just a moment, but I just want to tell you that um, you know, we do programs in the five county areas surrounding Philadelphia that raise awareness about substance use and misuse and addiction. We do everything from prevention to early intervention to crisis management and supporting ongoing recovery. And that's kind of that, that final um, end of the spectrum is where we are this evening. So we are really excited about this. We have another program that's called Pathways to Recovery that looks more at therapeutic models to support folks in, in their um, um, achieving recovery um, and sustaining it. But this is really taking a look at, you know, how is it that we can deepen our recovery? I'm, I'm the parent of someone in recovery. I can support myself in recovery as well as someone who's been through this um, with my son. Um, and I love the recovery world and it's become my life's work these last uh, 10 years. So that's how long our organization has been around. Um, but you know, we have an opportunity tonight to talk about a couple of topics that will get us started on this journey of creative recovery. And um, there's more exciting stuff to tell you, but I'll kind of keep moving. We have a really packed, wonderful, wonderful panel. I want to introduce you to Judy Hirsch. Can you unmute and say hello, Judy? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Judy. She's our program director, wears a lot of hats as well uh, as, as these small organizations are. I don't know if Kara is on with us yet. Um, she's zooming home after her last job. <laughs> she's got a lot of hats too, but she's our communications manager and does such a great job and we love her. And I don't have his picture here, but Mike Blanche is with us. Uh, Mike, say hello. Hi, how are you guys? I was trying to unmute myself and from the year 2020. Nice to see everybody. Uh, Mike is, um, a, among other things, he's a private practice clinician. He has a wonderful group practice called Ethos LLC, but he's also, we're very fortunate to say, our clinical advisor. So um, as I said, Mike was a big inspiration for getting this project started. Um, I want to let you know that we are only recording this portion of the program where we have some presenters, the panelists, who are going to share their stories. When we get to Q&A, and I'm going to actually ask Judy to remind me in case I forget, I will stop recording. We want to make sure that everyone feels very comfortable unmuting and asking questions and joining the conversation. You're also welcome to submit questions in the chat at any time, uh, but we will get to a Q&A toward the end of the program. I always like to remind folks that we have these wonderful support group meetings that take place throughout the region. I'm sure that not everyone with us tonight is the parent of someone with a substance use disorder, but many of you might be. So please know that this section on our website has a lot of information about support for all of you. Um, we will have a survey that we love for people to take to let us know how was this for you? Was it helpful? Are there things you would love for us to present in the future? Um, just, you can give us your feedback. Tell us a little bit about yourself. It's, a, it's anonymous, but we just kind of like to know, you know what brought you there, what, what brought you to the program. So that would be great. And Judy will share that. It's not gonna pop up at the end of the program as it does if we were doing a webinar, but this is a meeting, so it will not pop up. So Judy will share that link in the chat with all of you when she's not busy letting people in the room. Um, so I wanna let you know that we have part two of this program coming up in two weeks, uh, two weeks from tonight, Monday, July 12. Um, and that evening we'll be focusing on music, writing, fine arts and spirituality. And we have some really, really exciting panelists set up for that one, more to come, um, but you can register for that program. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, at convo.zone slash creative two, because that will be part two. And Judy will share that with you. Oh yeah, coming up tomorrow, Caroline Fenkel has a birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Caroline. You'll be hearing from her. Happy birthday. <laughs> there she is with Murphy. That's all that I really have, but um, I'm going to introduce you guys to our panelists. We're going to start with Jill, John Shields, but I'll tell you that John is with us to talk about uh, adventure and, uh, and really fun activities. And Ariel Ashford is here to talk about yoga and meditation. 
Uh, Andrew Deering is here to talk about the culinary arts and cooking in general. Uh, and then we have Dr. Caroline Fankel, birthday girl to be, and Matthew McFadden, both talking about um, working with animals and how that has supported and enhanced their recovery. I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, I'm gonna ask John to unmute and take us away. Okay, hi, thanks. My name's John and uh, I'm 13 years in recovery and uh, I actually have a daughter who's still uh, out there. And so I can appreciate both sides of the um, equation here. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, hopefully this will work. Sorry, uh, sorry, didn't start where I wanted it, but I'm gonna go back to the beginning. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is um, just a quick run through as a, almost a sprint, just to kind of show you some of the stuff that I'm fortunate enough to get to do these days as a result of you know living a life of uh, recovery. So uh, this is our home break in New Jersey. This is us down in um, the Osa, the tip of the Costa Rican Peninsula. This is back in uh, our state of New Jersey. This is a um, bell tower on a yoga retreat in Osara, um, Costa Rica. I'm can you hear me? We can hear you, but they're not advancing. We're just still seeing the first image. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll go back. Can you see that? Just still seeing the wave crashing. Okay, let's see if that goes. A little faster. How's that? Any better? Uh, so let's try advancing it. There you go. Yep. Okay, sorry. This is the OSA, New Jersey. This is a place where I have my home group in Nosara, Costa Rica. This is a bell tower on a yoga retreat. They have a 1230 meeting every day. So while I'm down there, we live down there for a month at a time each year. And um, this is one of the most beautiful beaches I've been on. This is in uh, Southern Costa Rica. This is a cove in Portugal with a beautiful wave coming into it. We surfed here uh, with my son and my wife. This is a little jungle trail that we run down every day when we live in Costa Rica, barefoot, surfboard twice a day, surf and um, in between come out and do our work and go to school. So uh, we're very lucky. This is that beach there in Nosara surfing out front. It's another, it's beautiful little place, beautiful wave every day. It's a little uh, tiki hut there out on the beach in Nassau. This is Long Beach Island where we live in the summer and I've taken up prone paddling. My knees don't allow me to run anymore. So it's a wonderful way to do distance. So I get up every morning at five and I go out and either surf or I do a prone paddle or something. This is my son and I down in um, Molokai in Hawaii. He competed in this race from Molokai to Oahu. And I was his support person jumping out in the middle of the ocean with him and uh, resupplying him as he went 32 miles on a paddleboard. This is in Nicaragua. This is outside of Bishop, California, up in the mountains in the Sierras. You climb that mountain. This is Yosemite, Mount Canas that I climbed. This is north of uh, our area. The Gunks is a place of uh, world-renowned climbing spot that I climb at a lot. This is one of the guys in recovery and I, uh, up at the gunks, this is Will. This is just sunrise every morning in the summer here. This is in France in the Pyrenees Mountains. This is in Spain in the Pyrenees Mountains. This is a mountain that I climbed up in Yosemite, uh, Cathedral Peak. This is in Puerto Rico. And this is up in uh, Taos in New Mexico. I just wanted to give a blanket of kind of the breadth of experience that I've been able to have, you know, in recovery. At the end of recovery, I was 35 pounds heavier and I never did anything anymore with anybody. You know, I was, I worked, I had kids and um, I was sad, I was hopeless and, uh, you know, life was miserable, frankly, even though on the outside, everything seemed fine. I found recovery and through recovery, you know, I started just treating my recovery with the basics that people taught me in my earliest days of being in the rooms. And that's every day I get up and commit to not using or drinking that day. 
I do some meditation, I go to a meeting, I call some other alcoholics, I do some service work, and at the end of the day, I say thank you and I um, review my day. And what's rad is that with this simple recipe of recovery, your life begins this upward spiral instead of a downward spiral. And so for me personally, I had more time, I felt healthier, I started having relationships again, all these things open up the world to you in a way that you can start to get back out and do things, you know? So for me, it's, it's this balance between just doing the prescription for my, treating my recovery and then kind of working on, um, you know, other aspects of my life. Once I started to feel better, I could train and start to try to get to some of the places like the tops of mountains or paddle out into big waves and you know, even traveling across, um, you know, driving around Central America and a pickup truck through rivers and things like that is fun and, and only a result of being in uh, recovery. As far as like the specific sports that I like to do, I think that there's an interesting overlap with the, um, you know, the needs of an addict and the addict mind, you know, it is exhilarating. It is that moment of like being there in the moment. Um, each of the sports that I happen to like, they're, I would call them bottomless because you can always learn more. And that is really um, compelling to me. One of the things about the images as well is that this whole idea of just having something that is this powerful force that drives you, that you want to do that thing. And that helps you to kind of get in shape, learn what you need to learn, follow time in the gym, you know, get connected with people who know what you want to do. All of these things to me are, are just like how I approach my recovery. These two kind of balance themselves off. You know? I think that people who are new in recovery can relate to all of these kind of things, the endorphins, the adrenaline, risk, all of that kind of stuff. And lastly, at the bottom, just the concept that you need to maintain a basic level of fitness to be able to get there. And for people who become ritualized in a recovery program, it's easy to add like one little thing, start running in the morning or something like that. And it starts that little drip that adds a little bit more and a little bit more, you know, over time, it's that progressive upward spiral again. I like, I made this little diagram, you know, I'm an architect, so I like thinking visually, but the idea of this infinite loop of my program of recovery on one side and the kind of life that I live in order to access the parts of the world that I want to, you know, the environments that I want to, I have to maintain each, I have my spiritual fitness, I have my physical fitness routine every day. Through them, I get a like self-awareness on the recovery side and on the other side in um, the adventure sport area, I learn, you know, I gain knowledge, gain techniques, gain the ability. And it, you know, the kind of Driving forces in both of those spaces are what I would call attractive forces, you know, for me and serenity is one in, on the recovery side and on gratitude on the other side, it's being in the moment, having those joyful opportunities to travel and to do things and share them with other people. This is a group of us from recovery that uh, went down to Ocean City surfing. I was just pointing out some of the um, overlaps in recovery and in um, these type of sports, you know, there's this built built in mentorship to surfing to climbing those type of sports that already flows well into the recovery world. Um, it meets you where you are in terms of fitness. So you could be a day out of uh, detox and still be able to go out and paddle out in a wave and catch a little foamer into the beach, you know, and those kind of connecting with something outside of the, um, the drudgery. I mean, so many of these people that myself included, you know, have been in a place that's a lot of darkness and to be able to be outside and to be connected with nature and to be able to feel physically, you know, challenged and mentally challenged. And so it's a wonderful thing. So, um, I think that, again, this idea of having free time, early sobriety, getting people out there. So, you know, we work with people informally at the moment, you know, we have little social media things connected here, chats and um, group texts and Facebook groups and meetups that we formed to kind of get people from the rooms into, uh, you know, into doing things that will make a difference in their lives, get them hooked, get that compelling force that's like driving them to do it on their own and, you know, drag someone else into the same thing as well. So, um, 
I just, you know, as far as like closing up the idea of having a general level of fitness and being able to connect to people who already do these kind of things. I have a bunch of numbers here, which we can either um, put in the chat or send out. I'm not sure how that will go, but you know, for surfing, I have my contact info up there and um, swimming, Jeff Rake, these guys were out there all winter long swimming in a pool and um, they do long distance swimming. They're gonna do an ocean mile out here in front of us um, this summer climbing, I put my number in there. Fitness and recovery is Sidra and um, yoga. We also have yoga on the panel tonight and um, soccer, if anybody wants to connect on soccer. So with that, I'll pass, thanks. Wow, thank you so much, John. That was, you're, you're clearly a very, very organized person who really put that together beautifully. Thank you so much. Uh, that's great information. And yeah, I'm gonna put that on the follow-up page that we mentioned, conversation.zone slash creative. So I'll get all that great, those great resources loaded. Um, and John, I'm, I'm gonna assume we're, we have everyone's permission who's listed there to share that information now, yes? Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, uh, next up is Ariel Ashford to talk about yoga and meditation. Ariel, would you like to unmute and share? Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, slight correction, it's pronounced Ariel. Um, so my name is Ariel Ashford. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay, it happens all the time. Um, yeah, so my name is Ariel Ashford and my husband and I um, have a conglomerate of businesses. One of them is Unity Yoga. Um, we also own, or it's not that we own, it's a nonprofit, Unity Recovery, and they are both located in uh, Maniunk. And uh, we just opened Unity Taqueria, which is in Roxboro. Maybe it's Maniunk, who knows, that line. Um, so I will talk about two of the three this evening, and uh, thank you for, for having us and um, inviting me here to share about my my passion and sidebar Caroline, which John was just talking about, she teaches for us over at Unity. So yes, she was uh, Robert and one of Robert and my teachers um, a few years ago. So we, we absolutely love and adore her. Um, once upon a time, my husband and I were walking our uh, wiener, Anthony Wiener in um, our wiener dog in a, uh, West Philadelphia. And I had had this idea a while ago that I was kicking around and decided to finally pitch him on it of opening a yoga studio slash community center for folks in recovery. Um, mostly because we learned that once you have a few years, it's kind of harder to find stuff to do. Um, where I'm from, which is originally Utah, we played a lot of sober softball. And once you, once about three years kicked in, um, I wasn't comfortable going to that. And I was in school at the time. Um, my husband would identify as being in recovery. I see myself very post that label. I don't consider myself in recovery. I don't consider that label for myself. I believe that through yoga and meditation, um, I've outgrown it. I don't do drugs and I don't drink. Um, but I, I don't label myself as being in recovery anymore. Uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So about eight months before this pandemic started, we opened the studio and RCO in Maniunk. Um, and we were very, very lucky and very fortunate um, to have well, it was really the state. The state gave us this wonderful grant to be able to provide recovery yoga for free uh, through the studio. So we have recovery yoga pretty almost every day. That is a, a free class for any, and you don't even have to identify as being in recovery. Anybody can come to this class or these classes that are multiple times through the week, um, both online and in studio. And we also have your typical vinyasa classes. All of our teachers teach under a trauma-informed lens, which means we are very mindful about the music we play so we don't have banging playlists um, that might have potentially triggering lyrics. We use blocks, so we really try to normalize the yoga experience. So if Sally Sue, who's been to maybe five classes, walks into the studio, she will feel comfortable in, in the class because we, we normalize the prop use. Um, and everything's a suggestion. So even if you would, 
if you were to come to one of my classes, you are so free and welcome to be in child's pose or shavasana the entire time. Nothing is expected of you and nothing is required of you in these classes. Um, you are welcome to show up exactly how you are, and we welcome you exactly how you are. And then you can enjoy your class in whatever way is right for you in that time. I have absolutely gone to classes and basically been in child's pose the entire time because that's what my body was calling for. So one of our new ventures is um, really diving deep into meditation, which was is something I've been practicing for coming up on two years now. And it's a specific type of meditation that's called yoga nidra, also referred to as deep relaxation. Um, and this is where, for me and my story, the rubber really hit the road after um, quite a few years of yoga practice and now finding my way into meditation and really embracing the rest of the eight limbs of yoga. Uh, this is where things really started to happen. I had done talk therapy for 10 years. I had done EMDR, you know, went to treatment, all that stuff. All great, laid a great foundation, not knocking it whatsoever because I believe it's important. However, it was the meditation and specifically coupled with sound therapy that really was able to um, break through a lot of things that were not touched or maybe couldn't be touched um, in a traditional talk therapy kind of way. So the, in this practice of yoga nidra which, or deep relaxation, which I am so excited to talk about in the workshop, um, it follows the same pattern of sleep so you you don't have to sit and you know duck duck dud and you know be this and do that none of that here this is you practice in shavasana you can practice laying down on your side you can practice in a seat in a car doesn't matter where you are um you are welcome exactly how you are and every single part of you is welcome in this space so we close if it's comfortable you close your eyes and this practice is fully guided I do have a few teachers who are trained, but this is my um, this is my baby. So I teach most of the I teach all of our nidra classes, uh, including yoga nidra for recovery, which is all of the nidras are trauma informed. But in yoga nidra for recovery, we go extra trauma informed, um, and it's very quickly becoming one of our most popular classes. So it's completely guided. It's very structured although it is also very dependent on who's in the room because as a facilitator you are tuned in and like mm, almost like a channeling of who's in the room and um perhaps things are coming to my mind as a facilitator that i'm bringing into the the meditation practice as well uh, we do a lot of work with um calling in ancestors and it's all that work that's done in the body and under the the paradigm of a healing resonance and that the meeting place in, is in the body. So, and how this works really great with yoga is, and I'm going to go a little wooey here. So, so not too wooey, but just like maybe just taking trauma and reconceptualizing it a little bit. If we, if we consider, uh, you hear this, like the issues are in our tissues and yoga can help release emotions and stuff like that. So if we think of the emotions being a constriction in the body so maybe even like oh like my shoulders are really tight or like my hips are really tight hamstrings stuff like that so let's just say maybe there's some energy or some trauma that's stored in the body asana yoga practice can absolutely help move through and release that you know there's been many times that i've cried in a pigeon pose it's a beautiful thing uh, maybe there's some memories that come up with that and maybe there's not and that is a very normal practice and very normal thing to happen in a yoga class now when we go into the space of yoga nidra which is somewhere between um, deep dreams and the void um, we can work through those same constrictions that are in the body uh, on a very subconscious level so maybe you have an experience where it's like I don't really know what happened, but I know something happened and now I feel a lot better. So just as an example, um, and this is, might seem, I don't know, kind of weird, but in the two years I've been practicing, my flexibility has increased dramatically. And I, it is my belief that that is working through things that I don't even particularly know that I'm working through. And that constriction in my body has now turned into an expansion 
and I am able to better like show up for life. I'm better to have boundaries. I'm better able to say, hey, you know what? I'm tired. I'm going to go rest now because this is all I can take. Um, I can show up for my daughter. I can show up for my husband. I can show up for my yoga studio and whatever else projects comes along. But I know that um, if I'm keeping that, that meditation practice and interacting with my, my guides, my teachers, um, that I, I'm, I'm in a good space. So little, little different angle perhaps, um, but that, that is what has really uh, changed, changed things for me. Um, so we have the loop it back around the, the yoga and meditation practice goes so beautifully hand in hand on, on so many levels and, and levels that we might not even be aware of. And that's where I think the real kicker is. It's not like being in talk therapy and having to perhaps relive those experiences in a verbal way. Um, so yeah, the whole studio is kind of peppered with this, this healing resonance. And I try to bring it into every class. And even in my yoga classes, we're still using the, these meditative con, uh, concepts in, in class. So yeah, you're, you're going to get it a little bit from me wherever, wherever our paths may cross. Um, on that, so that's that's the yoga studio, our, our newest adventure. I think I've gone over my time, so I will hurry. Um, our newest adventure has been the Takiera, which employs um, folks in recovery, folks coming out of prison and jails, those folks that, you know, have to check that box, maybe if they're a felon and they have a tough time finding employment. Um so that's that's very exciting. It's been very well received by the community and the yoga students and um, the uh, the community center. It's a <clears throat> it's a fifteen dollar uh, hourly rate, which is really great. And especially when we look at wanting to create equity, so our folks in recovery can get to a space where they can take care of themselves and pay their bills and whatnot. And then we could go into like the whole socioeconomic thing about you know, maybe if people are able to pay their bills and rent and whatnot, maybe some of these um, criminogenic behaviors go down. So trying to attack that from perhaps a little different angle. So thank you again. Would love to answer any questions when we get to that time and happy to share more about the um, workshop when we get there as well. Hey, Ariel, thank you so much. That was awesome. You got a lot in there, <laughs> appreciate it. Um, Andrew, are you ready? I am, yes. Good. Uh, I wanted to thank you, Kim, for inviting me to uh, speak to the group. It's nice to see you all. Um, this is my first time participating in something like this. I really come from a restaurant background and not necessarily a formal recovery uh, background, but uh, I'm happy to lend what I have to the conversation for the, uh, for the effort. Um, I'm here today to talk about my love for food and cooking and hope that I can convey a message of inspiration, motivation, and encouragement to find things in life that you enjoy and make you happy. Um, I have a lot of interests, and uh, including music and yoga and meditation and gardening, and um, but cooking I found to be a rewarding uh, pursuit and a rewarding use of my time that I like to share with others. Um, I don't want to occupy the limited amount of time that I have uh, talking about the, the, uh, the details of my path, uh, though I did want to point out a few significant steps along the way that I thought were relevant to share. Um, certainly, I, I credit my family with uh, raising me in an environment which cultivated my interest in food and cooking. Some of my earliest uh, memories as a child were uh, running around in my grandfather's garden on a hot summer night in my pajamas, uh, you know, um, a beautiful collection of vegetable beds and fruit orchards and grape arbors and uh, the ever present scary compost pile lurking in the back corner of the property. And my grandmother would compliment his efforts with uh, extravagant Sunday night dinners uh, using the fruits of his labor. So from a very early age, I, I found I have fond memories of this kind of farm to table awareness that I never let go of and uh, appreciate to this day. As I grew, um, my love for food and cooking eventually steered me towards culinary school. And uh, after that, a journeyman type of experience working as a professional chef. I worked in hotels in large cities in Baltimore and Washington and Philadelphia and small family owned businesses. 
uh, in rural Maine and all points in between. So it's taken me all up and down the East Coast. I cul culminated my professional experience in um, personal interests in a restaurant called Majolica in Phoenixville. Um, and my goal there was just simply to share my love of food uh, with the community that I grew up in and to make people happy. We sourced food from local um, farms and offered extravagant uh, tasting menus and exposing people to a wide variety of food and service that you don't commonly find. Uh, we operated it for 15 years and closed down in 2019 and it remains a big source of pride uh, and accomplishment in my life. Um, the road, however, wasn't always uh, rosy, and at a point I found myself ensnared in the grips of drug and alcohol addiction, uh, not an uncommon occurrence in the food service industry. Um, long and late hours, challenging uh, physical conditions and stress helped pave the way, but ultimately I made decisions that led to some dark and difficult times for me and my family. Uh, fortunately, with the love and support of uh, those around me, I was able to control my demons, and I'm proud to say that I've been sober for six years. Uh, now I work as a culinary director for the Manor of Hope, and I share my love and experience uh, in food and cooking uh, with young men in recovery. And it's a very rewarding experience, and I feel it's a, a natural combination of my experiences to date. Um, in preparation for today, um, I wanted to share some values that I've found um, in cooking and uh, food that I thought were relevant to me and my recovery and that I try to pass on to um, the young men that I, I see every day. Um, creativity and inspiration. These are qualities that fall um, in cooking and are, are uh, heavily uh, leaned on. Cooking uh, takes into consideration many different uh, flavors, colors, textures, temperatures, uh, availability of ingredients and challenges us to combine them um, using different cooking techniques to achieve something special and hopefully tasty. Um, we always look for sources of inspiration and those can be derived from restaurants that you may have visited, uh, taking a walk in nature and seeing something that kind of uh, fills you up. Farmers markets, uh, the different seasons, you know, the heat of summer or the cool of winter, uh, different regions that you may visit or different cultures that you may experience. Um, cookbooks and reading has always been a huge source for me. And um, I have a substantial collection of cookbooks that I lean on and uh, certainly lend them out to uh, the guys that I talk to and encourage them to uh, expand their horizons that way. Um, one book in particular that uh, I get no uh, endorsement from is uh, Culinary Artistry. It's a, it's a reference book. It's very useful if you um, you know, find yourself um, you know, kind of in a, in a difficult spot with uh, exercising that creativity and it simply lists ingredients and uh, then complementary ingredients. So like tomatoes, for example, and then all the things that complement tomatoes. And so while it doesn't give you a recipe per se, you can go through the list and um, pick out um, different ingredients and put them together. And nine times out of 10, it's a pretty good combination. Uh, I, I gave, um, Kim, uh, the title and author of the book there. So I just wanted to uh, share that with you. Um, so creativity and inspiration, that's uh, one value that uh, I try to impart. Sharing and an appreciation, that's a big one in the recovery world for sure. Um, uh, I love to, I love what I like about uh, this category is the pleasure that we get from food, both to others and to myself. Um, prepared with thought and love, the smile and appreciation that food can elicit from others is worth the effort. Um, cooking can be a gift of sharing and appreciation in bodies more than just the physical food, but a connection on an emotional level that's often hard to match. Um, a little bit of peace and quiet. That's uh, what we all need from time to time. And I found that uh, cooking 
can be an escape for a lot of us. Um, it's important to take some time out for yourself. And I think uh, if you can uh, spend some time to create a, a pleasant workspace in your kitchen and devise a plan, turn on some music and enjoy the process, um, it can be a very enjoyable experience. Um, take the time to care and work cleanly at an unhurried pace. Share the time with a friend or a loved one and appreciate everything that goes into that experience. Life will slow down for a little bit while you cook. And in that, uh, you can practice patience. You can practice repetition and focus and hone your skills, which you can apply to your lifestyle outside of the kitchen. Um, confidence, that's something that we have to instill in our young men and women. And um, the, as it applies to cooking, cooking, the more and more you do it, the more you will find that your repertoire and confidence growing. Uh, you may decide to make muffins, for example, and uh, from there with success, you might set your sights on something a little more difficult, like a cake or baking bread. One dish can lead to another. And with practice, you gain skill and trust in your abilities. And I think that that's important. Um, social values in cooking. I think that that's uh, kind of goes without saying, but it's something that's very valuable. Um, rather than buying something pre-made, something wrapped in plastic from a store that's full of preservatives, you know, we can make food together, know what's in it and spend time together. It's the social aspect of uh, uh, creating food. Food in the act of cooking brings us together and invites strength in the relationships of those around. If you uh, look at a holiday gathering, at least in my family, uh, everybody tends to gravitate to where the food is being prepared. Everybody winds up in the kitchen, you know, and it's just a, a wonderful uh, social event. So it really helps to reinforce the, the, uh, the importance of uh, social values. Uh, Open-mindedness, I think that's important um, for change. Um, you know, you have to be willing to try new things, to live a different life, to, um, you don't necessarily, with regards to foods, I always say you don't have to like it, but you should be open to trying it at least. Um, if you don't like it, you can spit it out and not eat it again, but <laughs> um, uh, also, uh, you know, it, it provides us with a, a uh, uh, family values. You sit and you eat uh, with friends and family, enjoy conversation, practice good table manners in my house anyway, and enjoy some real good family time. Um, every night, uh, excuse me, every Sunday night uh, there at the manor, we always have a family night everybody's schedules are, you know, different and people scatter during the week, but we always make time to sit down on a Sunday night and have dinner together. Um, so it reinforces fellowship and community. And uh, that's very important to us as well. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say that I always felt that cooking is an act of love and a way to show um, people that you care, food prepared with love has the ability to pass that love along. Um, and that's a big one. For these reasons and more, I found food and cooking to be a blessing in my life and a, signific a significant influence on who I am today. I love sharing stories and I love talking about food. And I'm very thankful for the time that you've given me to talk about my passion with you. That's it. Holy cow, that was, I'm so inspired by all of you. This is amazing. I, I can't wait to hear from you. I'm, I'm hoping we're all kind of piling up some questions out there because I really would love to hear what all of you think about all this and what inspires you and what might be part of your recovery and what you might want to make part of your recovery. So hopefully something you hear this evening will, will fortify that. Uh, Caroline Fankel, Dr. Fankel. Hi guys. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about um, animals and what they mean to me. Um, and I'm going to do it in the context of, um, you know, myself and my own sobriety. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how it's affected me professionally. 
Um, when I was growing up, I was really into horses. Um, specifically, I was really into competing horses and um, really loved dogs as well. All throughout my life, me and my mom really bonded over our Irish setters that we had and all of the dogs that we had. Um, and my mom really also loved animals and she would let me, you know, go to the pet store and pick out a hamster. And then I would like name the hamster and bring it upstairs and we would hide it for my dad. And my dad wouldn't know that the hamster has been living in the house for like, you know, <laughs> three months <laughs> until it gets loose. And then we have to tell him about the hamster living in the house. Uh, birds, also anything, anything that was an animal. I was just completely obsessed with as a kid. Um, and like I said, really big into horseback riding, um, was really a, a passion of mine. And I wanted to go to the Olympics and ride horses. I was competing at a very high level until I, um, got a DUI, had to go to rehab, was using a lot of drugs. Um, and when I went to rehab, um, I, it was the first time that I spent 30 days without an animal in my life. And, um, it broke my heart. I remember like, walking into rehab and thinking like, how am I not going to see a horse, you know, for the next 30 days? Um, I started riding when I was three. Um, so, and I, I rode every single day. Um, and so it was really hard for me. Um, and you know, the next, next thing that, you know, the rehab that I went to sent me to this other rehab that was like in Tennessee and they're supposed to be horses, but like there really weren't, you know, like you didn't get to do that much with them. Um, and then I was thank, thankfully I was able to end up at a, at a program where I was there for about four months and, um, I found a barn that was local to there and, um, ended up starting to ride this horse and his name was Dewey. And, um, at that point in time, I had like two months sober. I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to stay sober. Um, and you know, I just, I just started finding that love and that passion again for just the horse's personality instead of going and competing and winning and traveling all over the country. And, um, I had this really magical moment where, um, you know, one of the things that I really believe in when it comes to recovery is helping others. And, um, and I think that helping others is, uh, the most important part of recovery. A lot of people say that it's God. A lot of people say that it's service for me. It's always been helping others. And, um, I went to this, I, you know, I was dating some guy, <laughs> what, three months over. He breaks my heart. I'm a mess. I'm hysterically crying. My sponsor gets on the phone with me and she says, you know what you need to do? And I said, what? And she said, you need to go to a meeting and you need to find a girl who's struggling and you need to help her. And I was like, help her. Like, I'm a mess. This guy broke my heart. He's the biggest a-hole ever. Can you believe that he's dating this other girl from the other recovery house? You know, the whole thing. And, um, she was like, just go to a meeting. So I went to a meeting and this little girl raised her hand and I don't know, she was like, whatever I was 19. So she must've been like 16 or something. <laughs> she seemed young. And, um, you know, she, she shared about being upset, um, about what was going on in her life. She had like three days sober. I had three months sober. So, you know, I thought I could really help her. Um, and, um, I, I talked to her after the meeting and I said, you know, I, um, I ride horses. I go to this barn, you know, and, um, that's nearby here. Do you want to go? And she had a car and I didn't have a car. I would bike everywhere. I was biking everywhere that I was going. And so she said, yeah, I'll pick you up. So I, she picked me up and I took her to this barn and, you know, it's a really magical experience for people who don't have access to horses when they walk up this huge, amazing, big thing that they don't have, you know, that they've never experienced before. And she was a little bit scared and a little bit really liked it. And we sat down and we talked for a while, just staring at this horse, Dewey, who's super cute. And, um, you know, he just brought, brought to me a lot of happiness and a lot of fulfillment and really showed me that I can help others through introducing them to animals and my love for animals. And, um, so it was just really this beautiful moment. Um, and you know, it sort of is what sparked some of my equine therapy, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, at this, at that time, I didn't believe in God. Um, I was told that in order to get sober, I had to believe in God. And I really didn't, I was like reading Nietzsche and I was like, God is dead. And you know, I was 19, whatever. I didn't know anything, you know, and 
I just was, I, I didn't understand what God had anything to do with sobriety. And, you know, I was just, I was like a little, you know, whatever. And, um, rebellious, I guess you could say, I want to say it's a bad word, but, um, I'm going to hold myself back here. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> my sponsor had me write down everything that God is not right. So I wrote down everything that God is not God. My God is not punishing. My God is not Jesus. My God is not some guy in the sky. My God is not male, right? Like all sorts of, you know, whatever. And then she just was like, well, what is God? And I was like, she was like, you know, what is it? And I was like, the first thing that came to mind was like seeing an animal's eyes, right? Like a dog's eyes or a horse's eyes and that innocence that's in there. And um, from that moment on, I like decided that animals will be my higher power and I will pray to animals and I will be with animals. And um, it has really helped to shape the, my recovery. And it's really helped me to, you know, I, I've always dreamt of having a like little farmette where I'm able to have horses around me um, and have, you know, goats and pigs and chickens. And I've made that a reality. I only have horses and a little donkey right now, but um, I will soon get pigs and, and goats and um, chickens. You just can't tell Mike about it. <laughs> it's going to be the same situation where I'm going to be hiding it like I did with my dad. <laughs> Um, but anyway, in recovery, I think that animals have really saved my life. Um, I believe that working towards something like working towards getting a farm mat and working towards having my own animals and being financially independent to be able to take care of those animals, et cetera, are all things that really drove me to, um, get a job and to not just teach riding lessons for the rest of my life. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, I had this an uh, incredible dog who, you know, I, I can't talk too much about cause I'll just start like really crying. But, um, I got this dog while I was in a relationship with, in a very unhealthy, toxic relationship with this guy. And, um, this dog, like I'm telling you, he watched us fight. Right. And we had these very unhealthy fights and he just like gave me the strength and the courage to leave this guy. And like, I'm telling you, if I did not have this dog, I would still be with like this horrible human being and I would not have met Mike and, you know, I can't talk about him. Um, and I lost him and it was horrible and, you know, it was terrible and horrible. And I thought I was going to have to like go to rehab again. And like, I was going to get drunk again. Cause he was like my God and, you know, the whole thing. And, um, I didn't. And I was just surrounded by people who really loved me and helped me through it. And now I pray to him, you know, and it's fine. He's my, you know, he's my, he's my garden angel. He's the one that watches over me. And, um, I, you know, I was always afraid to make animals my higher power because when they pass away, it's so horrible, but I feel like he's with me all the time. So it's uh, like, it's a type of, like higher power that I had never really experienced before, even when he was around me all the time. Um, so that's all that I have to share now that I'm really tearing up here. Um, but what I can just say is that like one of my favorite parts about having animals, especially now at my property and something that we're going to do in a workshop is, um, and we've just moved in here a year ago, so we have not had been able to really have people over to do equine therapy. I met my husband doing equine therapy. Mike and I first met when we first started doing equine therapy together with his um, clients. And, um, you know, basically, like, we've created an arena, we've got these horses now, and now we're kind of ready to launch into something like this. And it's just so exciting. Um, and so I'm excited if people want to come to our little workshop that we might do, um, which I'm sure that Kim will give you guys details on, but thank you guys so much for letting me share about my experience with animals. Thank you so much, Caroline. Really, really appreciate it. We miss Graham a lot, don't we? He's a really special guy. Um, Matthew, are you ready to share? Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Hi, okay, Matthew. Great. This is my first ever Zoom presentation, so here we go. 
Um, my name is Matthew McFadden. I am going to share my screen. Um, I create PowerPoints to keep me on point. So um, I also am a massive, massive animal lover, um, both from what uh, animals have done for me to uh, just make life thrive, um, but also what they've been able to do with the guys that I've uh, helped along the way. So uh, I thought I would use my time instead of just talking about uh, how animals can help as just a little public service announcement, because I actually get the request from guys that I help about wanting to get a dog um, quite a bit. So I'm pretty versed in the, in the process. So I just wanna talk very quickly about who I am, the pros of owning a dog, questions to consider, and then alternatives to ownership, um, which that one is, uh, is special in my heart. So I'm a teacher. I've been a mental health professional since 2008 uh, in Philadelphia for nine years and for the last four years in Phoenixville at the Manor of Hope. Um, and I own the dogs that uh, we bring to the guys every day, Scout and Flash, who you will see quite a bit of uh, in the next six minutes. So the pros, um, and again, I've experienced these myself, and then I've gotten to see uh, guys Really, it brings out the best in them to be around animals, especially dogs. Um, but the bigger purpose, the healthy routine, um, Scout Flash and my wife and I take uh, four miles of walks, two in the morning and two at night every day. Um, it's a fantastic way to start the day for guys who struggle with depression um, and that reason to get out of bed. It's impossible, well, almost impossible not to when you got the dog. Um, you know, sticking its nose in your arm at five o'clock in the morning to get up. Um, so really healthy routines. It's a fantastic way to start the day. Um, a lot of people know about their ability to calm anxiety, um, hence the whole therapy dog industry. Um, you can connect with new people. As a pet owner, I put maybe, I'm gonna talk about working with difficult dogs a little bit later because it's worth addressing. Uh, you can learn a new skill. I got Scout, she's the cattle dog with triangle ears. Uh, I had no idea what it meant to have a challenging dog until Scout. We, I grew up with like bearded collies and dogs that you could bring everywhere. So I learned a lot about um, training dogs through her. And then you get the photos, which is a large part of my life is taking and sharing photos of my dogs. Uh, is this going to go forward? Like this one, um, which is adorable in her Christmas sweater. And then that's Flash. He's our older guy. Um, but yeah, so if you get a dog, you get to take pictures of it and show people when you meet them. Like when I met Kim the other day and showed her pictures of my dogs almost immediately. Um, so the questions to consider, the pros are there and they're very clearly outlined. And um, it's hard to find people that haven't experienced the positives of owning a dog. Um, but I felt like it was important for me just to talk because for everybody, but then especially for people in early recovery, uh, I do ask them to consider questions before they run out and get a dog. Um, that's just a public service announcement because I work with shelters a lot and I just want to make sure that um, people are ready to avoid not just major stresses in their life, but um, returning dogs to shelter. So just very quickly, I'm going to go through these. Uh, the time and money piece. So this little fact, um, if you talk to somebody who wants to get a dog, uh, it's very, very important that you talk to them about their finances because it's heartbreaking um, for people. And this slide says it all. A lot of people uh, misunderestimate. So I bring my dogs around the therapeutic community that I'm the director of. Uh, everybody's like, I really want a dog and I know their finances. And I'm like, we need a little bit more time first um, because it, it, can, it can cost a lot. Again, not a reason not to do it, um, but I just threw this up here. So annual expenses can be between 500 and $1,500 a year. That's the estimate. Um, so again, I would find them totally worth it. Scout the cattle dog who I'm petting right now, if it looks strange, cause she's by my side. Um, you know, she has, 
enhanced my life way more than, um, you know, money can, can buy, but, um, it is important to discuss with somebody. If you're in early recovery, uh, dog ownership might not be the, the perfect thing right in the beginning, um, unless you have financial help, but we'll talk about alternatives to ownership. And there's the unexpected costs. This is a picture of Flash after his $2,500 surgery the other, about three months ago. He is uh, killing it now. He's very healthy. He had a tumor removed, um, but that's in him and his cone of shame. And then this last thing that I just want to talk about in terms of a question is, do you get a challenging dog or do you get an easy dog if you are financially ready to do it? Uh, Scout is the challenge. She uh, is wonderful, but I didn't know that, you know, I'm married and I have a, a baby on the way. Um, if I needed to meet another girl, I would not be able to do so with Scout because she won't let anybody within, you know, 15 feet unless you're uh, a guy in recovery, apparently. That's the only people she'll allow around. Um, but, you know, it, it presents some challenges. I wouldn't change it for the world that I have her, but um, Flash, on the other hand, you could bring him around babies and everybody from 100 year olds to in between. And, um, and that's really wonderful. And you can use Flash to meet new people and you can take them to the park and, and meeting other dog owners is fantastic. So um, definitely a question to consider if you're jumping in, what, what kind of dog am I ready for right now? Am I ready to put the time in? Um, and if I really want a dog to be able to meet people, then you can just choose that if you go to shelter. All my dogs always come from shelter. Uh, and alternatives to pet ownership. So I talk about this with the guys, if I feel like maybe they're not ready in the end, it's gonna be their decision. But um, we partner with a couple, the Manor partners with a couple shelters for our guys to volunteer at. You can uh, dog walk as a job. And so you can make money while being around lots of animals. And then there's always fostering and people don't always think about it so much. And some people don't know about it at all. Um, but fostering is you get to take a dog out of shelter and you keep it and you help find its forever home, which is something that my wife and I are big fans of. Uh, these are foster dogs that we used to have that have uh, wonderful homes right now. And I'll bring it back to Flash with the easy one. Oh, I'm all over the place. The easy guy was our last foster. He was a failed foster. So he was just so wonderful that we kept him. But um, I just wanted to throw that out there to people because um, you might not be ready to own a dog and that's completely fine. It doesn't mean that you can't get the benefits from them and you can do a lot of good along the way. So um, that's it, a little public service announcement. Uh, I will always have dogs. There will never be a time in which I don't. Yep, she's still right there. But, uh, but that's it. Fosters, I'm done. Uh, thank you, Matthew. I it was really appreciated what you just said. That was great. Thank you very, very much. Nice PowerPoint. And I'm with you. I can't, I can't function without a PowerPoint reminding me what I need to say. Uh, so I'm going to stop the recording now.